Well, good morning. Kay and I had an opportunity Friday night to uh, go up to Arthur to a rodeo up there. I don't know that I've ever been to a rodeo, maybe just looking over the fence and seeing maybe bits and pieces, but we really enjoyed that. We had us a nice Himalayan steak on the way up there. And uh, some of you may wonder, Himalayan, where, you know, where does that come from? Uh, well, we saw him laying in the road. And uh, so we just stopped him, picked him up, threw him on the carburetor. And by the time we got up the rodeo, it was nice and well done. And that was a barbecue, by the way, in case you're not familiar. Anyway, had a great time at the rodeo. They're going to have one at Pioneer Days here next weekend. So if you get a chance, you want to go to a rodeo, we may, we may attend our second one. I don't know. Uh, you know, Galatians chapter 2, verse 20 My old self is being crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Take up your cross. Take up your cross is all about transformation from the inside out. It's about radical transformation inside ourselves that leads to transformation in the world. You know, by sacrificing our own agendas and working towards uh, Jesus' direction, we are able to help reverse the effects of spiritual decay in our families, in our communities, in our country, in our world. And by sacrificing our own agendas and working towards Jesus' direction, that's what we can accomplish. So, he, uh, in the New Living Testament, uh, Jesus said it this way in Matthew chapter 5, uh, verses 3 through 10, which is the Sermon on the Mount, by the way. He said, God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him, for their kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses those who mourn, for they will be comforted. God blesses those who are humble, for they will inherit the earth. God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice, for they will be satisfied. God blesses those who are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. God blesses those whose hearts are pure, for they will see God. God blesses those who work for peace, for they will be called the children of God. And God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. You know, the first step to taking up your cross is to choose to follow Jesus Christ. This morning we're going to become a little more familiar with a man by the name of Simon of Cyrene. Uh, he was there, uh, perhaps not by his choice, but he was there when they crucified our Christ. We do not know a great deal about Simon, and this morning I'm going to ask you to use your imagination a little bit as we look at uh, some verses that imply but also scripture as well as history as to the life of Simon Cyrene. A little research throughout Acts, Romans, and the Gospels, we can begin to piece together a little bit more about Simon of Cyrene than we hear in our text today. But our text today, as we continue our study in the Gospel of Mark, is Mark chapter 15. And we're going to begin uh, with the last verse in last week's study, and that is, uh, chapter 15, verse 15, and then we're going to read on through 22, reading from the word of our Lord. Wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barnabas to them. He had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. The soldiers led Jesus away into the palace, that is the praetorium, and called together the whole company of soldiers. They put a purple robe on him, then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on him. And they began to call out to him, Hail, King of the Jews. Again and again they struck him on the head with a staff and spit on him. Falling on their knees, they paid homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they took off his purple robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. Verse 21, a certain man from Cyrene, Simon the father of Alexander and Rufus, 
was passing by on his way in from the country, and they forced him to carry the cross. They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. Won't you pray with me, please? Father God, we are blessed to be uh, together in a time of worship this morning. So, Father, as we uh, get into your word to uh, worship you through your word, uh, Father, we thank you for... uh, preserving your word for us throughout the many, many ages that we might come to know Jesus Christ, our Lord, uh, better than we did when we come in, and that we might share that as we go out into the world. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Our text gives us the longest introduction of who Simon is, and we see that again in verse 21, which we Uh, just read, a certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on the way from the country, and they forced him to carry the cross. Simon of Cyrene, forced to carry uh, the cross by the Roman soldier uh, to Golgotha, where Jesus was to be crucified. Simon of Cyrene is mentioned in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all of the Synoptic Gospels, as the man who carried the cross for Jesus uh, to the location of his death. And again, that is Golgotha. Since Cyrene was located in modern-day Libya, uh, many have suggested that Simon was a dark-skinned African man who had come to Jerusalem to worship during the Passover. You know, our text says that he was the father of Alexander and Rufus. Why were their names mentioned by Mark in his gospel. His sons might have been doing ministry uh, in Rome. Mark may have included the names of Simon's sons, suggesting that they were of uh, some standing in the early Christian community at Rome. And besides, Mark, after all, was writing to Gentiles who were Christian converts and Roman believers. Uh, He wrote wrote this letter uh, for the church at Rome. You know, tradition states that Alexander and Rufus had become missionaries in Antioch. Antioch was the capital of ancient Syria and the leading city for the Roman East in the area now known as southern uh, Turkey. And perhaps very likely their names were written as name recognition for Simon. Simon was born into a dedicated Jewish home in North African city of Cyrene. Likely the Jewish family was at some point a part of the dispersed, the dispersion, if you will, the scattering of the Jews earlier on. His parents expressed their faith at his birth by naming him Simon, the name of one of the famous sons of Jacob, the patriarch. Now, as Simon grew into manhood, he most likely dreamed, as most Jewish boys did, of going to the holy city of Jerusalem to observe the Passover. I mean, that was a dream of most uh, Jewish uh, boys. The festival commemorating the liberation of Israel uh, from Egypt, of course, Passover. And you know, such a pilgrimage was the aspiration of all the faithful Hebrew people that were scattered literally across the world. In fact, it was a command of God that all Jewish men go to Jerusalem every year to celebrate the Passover. But now many Jews lived outside of Israel and therefore could not make that long journey uh, back to Jerusalem. By all indications, Simon was a faithful follower of the Jewish faith and he worked hard to accomplish his desire. And so finally, Simon of Cyrene was about to realize his dream. He's going to Jerusalem for the Passover. You know, we can imagine his heart just beating with excitement as he entered the holy city for the very first time. Now he would see with his own eyes the places which he had only heard about, the temple, uh, the Mount of Olives, and the beautiful places in Jerusalem. Something was wrong, though. When Simon arrived in Jerusalem, he found the city in an uproar. He didn't know that a man named Jesus had just went through three fake trials on trumped-up charges, and falsely accused and sentenced to be crucified. 
Look back with me at our text, if you would please, uh, to verses 15 through 20. 15 through 20. Wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barnabas uh, to them and he, Jesus, had Jesus flogged and handed over to him to be crucified. And, and the soldiers led Jesus away into the place that is the pra- palace, that is the praetorium, and called together the whole company of soldiers. And they put uh, a purple robe on him, then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on him. And they began to call out to him, Hail, King of the Jews. And again and again they struck him on the head with a staff and spit on him. And falling on their knees, they paid homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple robe and put his own clothes on him. And then they led him out to crucify him. You know, Simon did not know that a man named Jesus had just went through these trials and turned over to the people uh, and the the Roman soldiers uh, to be mocked, to be beaten, and then crucified, to be killed. So here Simon is. He stumbled upon this strange spectacle as he came into Jerusalem for the Passover. He saw a noisy crowd just clustered around a band of soldiers. In the midst of the soldiers was an obviously weary man bearing a Roman cross. Having been mocked and made fun of, beaten, flogged, he was bleeding from this crown of thorns. And many of you have seen a depiction of that in the movie, The Passion. Experience told Simon that he had probably been whipped with a scourge across his back. A scourge consists of a rope with with metal balls at the end tied into the rope, bones, metal spikes. It was impossible to make out the man's features. He must have been hit many times, even in the face. And most of the crowd was heckling the condemned man. Some spit on him, and occasionally he was pelted with stones. So the soldiers were prodding him to hasten. Come on, let's move along. Any observer could see that the man was about to fall beneath the weight of the cross. And when Simon saw what was happening, he decided to stay in the shadows. And just then, the soldiers decided that they had had enough of this slow pace. And so they wanted to finish their assignment. They glanced around for someone to carry the cross, and their eyes fell on Simon. One of them grabbed Simon growled, you take the cross out to the hill. And Simon had not planned to be a part of this spectacle. He had no idea what was going on. Simon was powerless to refuse. I mean, Roman soldiers had the power to recruit any non-Roman anytime they pleased. And if Simon refused, he could most likely receive the same fate as the condemned man. So he shouldered the cross and he, and he followed the soldiers to Golgotha. Mark in our text put an emphasis on Simon. Mark's mention by name, the one carrying the cross, Simon of Cyrene, is a clear indication as to the meaning of our text, of this passage. They forced him to carry the cross. Verse 22 They brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. The place of the skull. Everyone was talking about the teacher from Galilee. Simon discovered that his name was Jesus and that he had a very large following. The people that he met in the streets were sharply divided over this Jesus and his identity. Some felt certain that he was the long-awaited Messiah, But others considered him a false prophet. And I am certain that Simon heard all of these things that were going on around him, all of the conversation. The only friends the man appeared to have was a group of women who followed closely behind him. Their sobbing and expressions of love was the only kindness that the man received. Maybe it was the outcry of these women that that caused Simon to take a second look at this condemned man. 
How compassionate, I wonder, and passionate are we when sharing what Christ did for us through all of this? It was all for you and me. Somewhere along the way, he likely became aware that he was bearing the cross of Jesus of Nazareth. Simon may not have known at the time, but the soldiers unknowingly granted Simon a very special gift to carry the cross of the Messiah, the Savior. You know, any of us who know Jesus would have been honored to carry the cross. In a, in a, in a real sense, the opportunity bear his cross is always with us, always to bear the cross of Jesus, to carry the cross. You know, in Matthew chapter 16, if you turn back to that for me, Matthew 16, looking at verses 24 through 26, in the words of Jesus, Jesus said, to his disciples, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will find it. What good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world, yet forfeits his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come to his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what he has done. I went one verse too many, but we can never go too far in our text. Many people interpret the cross to be taken up, and you've heard it, as some burden that they must carry in their lives. That's not what the cross is all about. You have heard it said in a strained relationship, a thankless job, a physical illness, etc. This must be my cross to bear. And so with self-pitying pride, they, they look at their difficulty and say, that's my cross that I have to carry. It's not what Jesus meant. Take up your cross and follow me. You see, back then, when a person carried a cross in Jesus' day, no one thought of it as a persistent annoyance or a symbolic burden. To a person in the first century, the cross meant one thing and one thing only, death and crucifixion. The cross symbolized death. Since God's word means the same today as it did yesterday, that is the interpretation we have to go with. Give up your life for Jesus Christ. Give up your life for Jesus Christ. Jesus' command to take up your cross and follow me is a call to humble oneself and to self-sacrifice. One must be willing to die uh, to self in order to follow Jesus. Dying to self is an absolute surrender to God. Although the call to take up a cross is tough, the reward is matchless. I mean, nothing in this world is worth passing up an eternal life with our Savior, Jesus Christ. Are you willing to lose your life, to die to self, to follow Jesus, to do his Will, are you willing to lose your life to die? You know, to voluntarily sacrifice his life for you that you could have eternal life and life more abundant, John 10 and 10. I have come that you may have life, Jesus said. Simon may not have realized anything good at that very moment. At best, he viewed it as an inconvenience. I mean, after all, bearing the cross took time away from the other activities that he had planned for this spatial day, his first day in Jerusalem. He had not planned on such an interruption. Simon's resentment probably went even deeper, being treated like a common slave on what was to be the greatest day of his life was just too much. It hurt his pride, I'm sure. He may have said to himself, would the people think that I am a follower of this Jesus? Or would someone think it was my cross? 
What if, what if he met one of his friends on the way? Cross-bearing never seems to be a gift at first. And I wonder what was your first reaction to cross-bearing? Were you surprised how others treated you simply because you're a Christian? How could anyone question your motives and accuse you wrongly? Jesus knew this would be a problem for his disciples, so he gave frequent and thorough instructions on the matter, encouraging his disciples to rejoice whenever they bore the shame of the cross. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, or 2 through 3. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Ignore the shame of your sins because Jesus took them to the cross. I cannot help but to believe that this event changed Simon's life forever. The rewards of cross-bearing may be hidden to the natural eye, but it is seen by those who walk in the Spirit. The Apostle Paul describes that suffering as a gift. We are favored by the Lord when we suffer for him. So cross-bearing should be acknowledged. It should be acknowledged in our public commitment. Was Simon a Christian? Well, we, we can't say for sure. We can only speculate. It is likely Simon was born again on the day of Pentecost. Why? Well, I can say that because Luke reports that men from Cyrene were among the 3,000 converts in that day, Acts chapter 2, that were baptized. The manner in which Jesus died must have impressed Simon, and Jesus, and Jesus showed no fear throughout the ordeal, but showed a remarkable peace instead through the whole thing. The only time Jesus said anything during his ordeal was when he prayed to God, or to help someone else. He never appealed to the soldiers for mercy or accused them of injustice. Jesus was crucified on Friday, but by Sunday, the report of Jesus' resurrection had been circulated throughout the city. Simon stayed on in Jerusalem. He had been thinking about the man and his death for 50 days. Then he heard Simon Peter, a disciple, who had faltered during the ordeal because of fear, declaring boldly that this same Jesus is both Lord and Christ. You know, Acts chapter 2, verse 36, Therefore let all Israel be assured of this, God has made this Jesus whom you crucified both Lord and Messiah. So it could well be that Simon of Cyrene was compelled at that time to believe on the day of Pentecost when he heard Peter's message. All of our sins were nailed to the cross. You know, the privilege of cross-bearing should be acknowledged in our active service for Christ daily. As we are holding back from this public identification with Jesus Christ, we need to think to ourselves, what is it we're doing? I must confess that there were times when I held my tongue, when I should have spoken up for my Lord, but never again. I will never deny him again. Hmm. Sounds a lot like Peter, doesn't it? I gladly bear my cross for him. Have you ever been afraid of the consequences for bearing your cross? Do you ever consider the potential cost way too high. Well, Simon had no choice his first time. He was identified with him, but what he learned about Jesus made him a willing cross-bearer more than likely. Simon learned that bearing the cross of Jesus was actually a privilege. And we also should make a public acknowledgement of our faith, and if that causes us to suffer, that's a cross that is a privilege to bear. So we should share the fact of, of cross-bearing. 
I have to believe that Simon was the one who led Alexander and Rufus, his two sons, to become missionaries. The Gospel of Mark was written to be used as a gospel tract in the city of Rome. And when Paul wrote a letter to the Roman church, he sent greetings to Rufus and his beloved mother. Romans 16 and 13 is where you find that, by the way. Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother and mine. There is a tradition that Rufus became an effective church leader and that his brother Alexander became a martyr for the cause of Christ. And it all began with Simon bearing a cross. So if we bear the cross, we will influence others. Wouldn't it be wonderful to influence our own sons and daughters and even our grandchildren to bear the cross of Christ as well? You know, I read a little quip on Facebook uh, the other day, and it said, I wouldn't change my grandchildren for the world, but I wish I can change the world for my grandchildren. Teach them to carry the cross, and perhaps we'll, we'll see a change. You know, there is a hymn that contains the following words. Must Jesus bear the cross alone and all the world go free? No, there is a cross for everyone, and there is a cross for me. I read that there was another version of the hymn which says, Must Simon bear the cross alone and the saints go free? Each saint of thine shall find his own, and there is one for me. Each one of us is called to bear the cross of Jesus Christ, and it's imperative that you make a public commitment of your life to Jesus Christ. You must be willing to bear any shame or suffer, any loss in his service, in his service. A lady by the name of Irene Farrell, and I'm going to close with this. She graduated from the Bible Institute of Los Angeles with a burden for overseas missions. She found her place in the Congo where for 10 years she taught school, shared Christ, and worked in a dispensary in the Kwailu bush. In 1964, communist rebels mounted a guerrilla raids to overthrow the government. Missionaries in the Kwailua province were threatened. Irene and her co-worker Ruth Heggie decided to evacuate from their station, and a helicopter was ordered, and on January 24, 1964, the two prepare, prepared their things to leave. They packed essential belongings and then gather, gathered their Congolese workers for a final time of worship. The final songs died down and the last prayers were offered and the women began anticipating the arrival of the chopper. When it didn't come, they decided to retire for the night and rise early to await the chopper the next day. And shortly after midnight, young, intoxicated rebels attacked and the youngsters, some barely teenagers, were smoking hemp, smashing windows, and screaming for blood. Storming the house, they, they dragged the woman from their beds and danced around them in wild circles in the moonlight. One youth shot an arrow into Irene's neck. With her last ounce of strength, she pulled it out, whispering, I am finished, and she died. Ruth Hagee, also struck by arrows, pretended to be dead, not even moving when one of the rebels jerked out a handful of her hair. Only after the attackers finally ran into the forest could Ruth crawl to safety, and many other Christians perished at that time. It was a killing time. Why was the helicopter late? Why do God's servants sometimes perish? Well, we might understand someday. Most likely, we will never be called upon to go through anything like these two wonderful women had to suffer. But each of us has a cross to bear for Jesus. Let's bear our cross joyfully, 
and serve our Lord until we go to be with him. Until then, we trust in him knowing that his kindness never fails. We surrender ourselves at the foot of the cross. If you're here today and you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, we're going to sing our invitation to him if I'd have the music team come forward. You know, I mentioned several times the gift of uh, carrying the cross. And I've also said many times in the past that a gift is not a gift at all unless you receive it. 